Welcome to our entrepreneur pitches from Haiti and Mexico. I am Dana Francois, Program Officer for Economic Development for Haiti from the Latin American and Caribbean team at the Kellogg Foundation with my colleague. My name is Sebastian Frias. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Also a Program Officer for the, the Mexico team and the international team for the Kellogg Foundation. And we're thrilled, we're thrilled, we're excited to share with you what feels to the both of us like our best kept secret. We've had the honor and privilege of working with all of those entrepreneurs for many, many years. I'm sure that many of you have had numerous conversations about risk, de-risking, anything. I think in our language, we do feel that in many, many ways, those entrepreneurs are at the forefront for for of change. And we've worked with them for many years. So we're wanting to share into what we know are tremendous, tremendously powerful and exciting opportunities in the context of Haiti and Mexico. This year, uh, we really wanted to showcase the work of these amazing entrepreneurs. We think what makes them unique is that they come from community, they're leading initiatives from community, um, and they're representing really the opportunities and, and how innovation can face challenges in rural context. Uh, we've been working with some of them for many years. We think they're at a fantastic stage to be invested uh, on and to partner with, and we're very, very happy to have other investors join us as we've uh, invested in these communities as well. Um, we think uh, that their voice is very important, also showcasing the leadership of communities in Mexico and Haiti and really bringing solutions based on community to the forefront. So we had a panel this morning. It was very interesting. Some of you were there um, showcasing this. And today is really a celebration, a celebration of their work, a celebration of Mexico and Haiti, of these rural and indigenous communities. Thank you. And with that, without further ado, and again, do connect with us and engage with us if you have any questions after because we're more than happy to share everything that we learn and everything that um, we've learned from them. So thank you and hope to connect with you soon. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Dani, and I'm here representing Dos Tierras. We are an artisanal brand that aims to and is making a difference in the lives of artisans from marginalized communities. Unfortunately, my friend and partner, Guillermo Jester, couldn't be here today to share our vision and all of our achievements with you, but I'm very much excited to be able to do this here today. Our other two founders, Tania Gomez and Reina Jimenez, are both artisan leaders from Chiapas. According to Coneval's 2020 report in Mexico, poverty rates are alarmingly high. Over 58% of the Yucatan population and a staggering 78% of the Chiapas population are living below the income poverty line. So our mission is to focus on projects that have actual economic impact in these regions to address this particular issue. Dos Tierras was born out of a dream and more than 20 years of experience working with artisans in various regions across Mexico. Guillermo, Tania, and Reina came together to create a collective brand that not only showcases the cultural diversity of our country, but also revalues traditional textile techniques for the international and contemporary market. We release two collections per year and we feature home decor textiles such as pillows, hammocks, tabletops, and a small fashion capsule collection. Let me show you here on our previous slide. You can see some of these. All of the items, all of the products that we develop are designed and inspired by these traditional techniques of these two regions that we work in. Currently, we sell our collections at trade shows in the US and Mexico, and we cater to both wholesale and retail customers. However, our primary source of income actually comes from collaborations with renowned brands and designers. We produce hundreds and sometimes even thousands of items annually for these partnerships. We've had notable collaborators that include West Elm, Four Hands, and soon 
we will be collaborating with Aeromexico, which is Mexico's largest airline. Now, in our first year as an independent company, we have sold over 15,000 items and collaborated with nearly 300 artisans from Yucatan and Chiapas. And we generated sales of $375,000. Now, this represents a very significant growth of 55%. This is compared to when we were members of the NGO A2 Artisans and all of the production and administrative costs were being covered by them. To continue our growth, we are seeking an investment of approximately $150,000 or in-kind donations. This can be goods and services. This is going to help us achieve our goal of growing by 100% or more which means that we aim to sell at least $700,000 worth of products this coming year. With this additional support, we can enhance the quality of life of the 300 artisans that we collaborate with, and we can increase their income through sustainable projects. Now, our main income currently comes from custom design production. We believe that investing and exploring other commercial channels, such as e-commerce, it's really going to unlock new opportunities for us. This obviously also comes uh, with the recent surge in e-commerce due to the pandemic, and so it represents a significant potential for us to expand and reach a wider audience. Now, I have showed you uh, and showcased our impressive results. I've shared what our expectations are for the coming year, and I've explained to you what our business model is. However, I believe that it's crucial for you to really understand who we truly are. I want to give you three words for this. Colaval, Wokolaval, Jumbutik. This means thank you in Sotzil, Celtal, and Maya. These are the languages of the artisans we collaborate with. And this embodies our gratitude towards them, towards their craftsmanship, and the opportunity that we have to uplift their communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your time and for being here. Please feel free to scan our information over here uh, for more details on this QR code. We really look forward to connecting with you. You can find me around as well. And we greatly, greatly appreciate your consideration and you being here. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I am from Haiti, and my name is Magali Noeldres, the founder and CEO of Caribbean Craft, a company that has been working with artisans across the country, featured in Ford Magazine, New York Times, Vogue, Better Homes and Gardens for the work that we've done. Over the years, we've developed collections for Anthropology, Pottery Barn, Crate and Barrel, West Elm, Donna Karen, to name a few. We attended major home decor shows, such as New York Now, Shop Object, America's Mart. Our company generated $1.5 million in a year in revenue for artisans. Hearing all this, what's the problem? We all know that Haiti has been going through the past three years major crisis that greatly affected the artisan craft sector. The international buyers were forbidden to come to Haiti. In addition to the long list that is on the screen, the access to market became the most pressing issue. Once again, we had to find a new solution to keep our artisans employed. More than ever, we had to make sure that they kept their job that is, on a, in a country like mine, a true luxury. We had to readjust our strategy and step out to the world. But how? With a market-driven approach. We created something unique based on alliances. By creating these alliances in and outside of Haiti, engaging fully our diaspora, and partner with institutions on the ground to help us develop our own expo, our Traveling Arts and Crafts Expo, to create a new sales channel for artisan groups in need of a job. A sales force unit is designed to be the engine of all activities. As we want to move forward 
with a market-driven approach. The Window of Hope is playing a key role. Our Traveling Arts and Craft Expo, between January and now, was featured five times in the United States. Our online platform is fully operational for direct sales and giving visibility already to 14 groups. While at Korean Craft, we continue to serve as a mini hub for the sector. By doing so, we aim to retain jobs, which is crucial at the moment. Too many companies are shutting down, people are giving up, entrepreneurs are quitting. We need to remain in business. We want to create new jobs, and we also want to bring back the revenues of 1.5 million for year one and double by year three. Besides the alliances that we're seeking here in this partnership, we are also seeking for a grant of $300,000 to invest in our communication strategy on marketing and sales, an investment of $750,000. We believe in the sector. We remain committed to our artisans, and we are proud to say that we are a resilient company, adjusting through difficult times while developing very strong plan for a bright future. On behalf of the artisans and our very powerful <laughs> dream team on the screen, I thank you for your attention and look forward to continuing our conversation with you whenever you want to reach out to us. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome for being here. I am Monse, and I am here to represent the 83 women artisans who are part of Juxta Nation. Juana Lopez Diaz is an artisan from Chiapas, Mexico. The lack of market value and opportunities discourage her to continue the practices that are part of her textile cultural heritage in search of a better paid opportunity. Her involvement with NGO Impacto, founded by Adriana Guerrevere 10 years ago, uh, encouraged her to pursue these textile traditions in Mexico. Juana's story is just an example of the 83 women who make up the social enterprise Juxta Nation. Historically, women belonging to the indigenous people of Mexico have been subjected to three oppressions by class, gender, and ethnicity. 65% of indigenous women over 12 years are engaged in unpaid activities. 18% receive an income of their work, and only 1% is, is an owner of some type of personal property. Artisanal activity is not seen as a source of income in women, for women and their families. On average, a woman artisan in Chiapas, Mexico, receives $1.6 per day, selling their, their pieces at lower prices. Formed by seven cooperatives of Los Altos de Chiapas, Juxta is a, co a commerce platform that connects artisans with consumer, consumers who are conscious and who want to, to pursue new products. Women in Juxta Nation are producers, owners, and partners. 80% of the cost of production corresponds to the artisanal labor of the members, which they receive upon delivery of their pieces. Uh, this increased their income by 500% uh, without increasing their working hours. By, by becoming owners of this enterprise, they receive additional profits of the sales. In the long term, they will be uh, becoming, uh, they will be have financial freedom and they can self-manage the enterprise juxta nation. This improves the quality of life, the lequilcoch lejal of their families and their communities. The sales market is looking for better options for consumption practices. On a study uh, by Global Scan on sustainability, they found that 1.1 billion of women are responsible consumers who are seeking high quality products that are artisanal, ethical, and sustainable. Uh, 723 billion 
dollars are in the world textile industry. In Mexico's textile market, it is equivalent for the 4% of this. And in five years, our goal is to reach the 0.01% of the national market of Mexico. In Mexico, there are 12 million indigenous artisans. Seven, 742,000 are textile artisans, of which 67% are women. Currently, there are 83 women who are part of Juxta Nation. We are planning to bring new members. This is our. Uh, this is uh, This is what we want to do. We want to have four four thousand nine hundred and seventeen members who represent the one percent of the women artisans in Mexico. For this, we have strategic alliances like NGO Impacto and Ensamble Artesano to help us reach throughout Latin America and Mexico. For the 500,000 in investment, we are searching for to scale the growth of the of of the enterprise. Sorry. For the sales platform, this will allow us to reinvest in the growth and expansion of Juxta Nation, allowing us to make national and international commercial alliances and to make Juxta Nation grow. This will set a new precedent in the textile sector with master artisans of Mexico and Latin America. The essence of Juxta Nation is based on social commitment, generating gender-focused enterprises where women increase their income by reducing their working hours. And this, in turn, reduce the environmental impact of the processes productions and the safeguarding of their cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. The future of fashion is sustainable, timeless, artisanal, and female. <laughs> Together, we walk this path. Juxta Nation. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sebastian Mortimer with AgriLog. Agrilog is a agricultural services company. We provide three key services uh, to farmers in Haiti. We're looking to solve a key set of problems. One of them is low crop yield, lack of access to financing, 60% post-harvest loss, and limited access to local buyers and export buyers. We do this through what we call a flex concept. With Flex, we provide financing, logistics, and expertise. One of the key areas of finance that we're doing today is a small accelerator where we choose small projects that we put capital into. Usually, these are amounts ranging from five to $10,000. On the logistics side, we take a full operational control of the uh, crops, meaning from the farm and to the final buyers. This includes uh, processing the crops, uh, storing it in our warehouse or cold chain, and the export process to US markets. Right, that's what, on the expertise side, we also provide business management services to the uh, farmers, meaning accounting, marketing, um, connections to uh, buyer groups, and also partnerships with universities and other institutions, such as the government or, um, for example, Minister of Finance for, for farming. Right now, we have pilots running nationwide. Um, these pilots have allowed us to reach around 2,600 farmers. The key crop right now in our pilot is peppers. Um, so if you like hot sauce, uh, we export peppers to the US and also mash it in a process, which is a process before um, converting it to the hot sauce. 
our goal right now is scaling these operations to be able to reach uh, more farmers and um, more distribution. Right now, we're at a run rate of roughly 800,000. And with a $2 million investment, this will allow us to reach a $18 million run rate um, in 18 months. This target is based on discussions with our distributor groups that we're already um, selling into, and they're asking us for more product, more product. Um, but this requires capital and time and um, investment. Uh, the use of funds is fairly straightforward. Um, we're investing in uh, the farmers directly into the infrastructure to allow us to um, process more products. We, what we've seen so far is for every $1,000 invested into the program, we're able to uh, increase farmer income by $500 per year. As I mentioned, our key ass is a $2 million investment. Uh, in addition to that, we're looking for partners in the agricultural sector. Uh, this includes food importers, a meal program, the government, um, and for example, institutions such as universities that have agricultural programs that can provide um, technical assistance to uh, our farming operations. So then I just wanted to invite you guys to visit our website, agrilog.ht. Um, this is a, our a good friend, a Kabe. He is the leader of one of our key cooperatives in the north of Haiti. Um, and with him, he's been able to increase his income, but also provide services to his community. Um, one of, like a key example is he provided a, a water fountain and um, cleaning and arranging of, uh, for example, like the small world work in the area. So I invite you to reach out to us on either our website. We've been featured by CBS News and other news, um, other news companies, so you can see more visuals about our operations. Um, Thank you for your time, and thank you for Kellogg for inviting us to this speech. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Pierre Noel. I'm the executive director of the Haiti Development Institute. Growing up in Haiti, in rural Haiti, with my grandparents, I often had to take care of livestock before school and after school. Also, once a week, we would find time to go irrigate the land. Sometimes we would stay at night until dawn. I knew then that access, lack of access to water lack of access to facilities, machineries, and lack of access to financing were key obstacles to farmer, local farmers in Haiti. Over the years, these gaps have grown quite a bit. And they have made local life for local farmers almost virtually impossible. This is why HDI has partnered to actually propose the Agri-Food Enterprise Entrepreneurship Center. This is a one-stop shop that proposes, and it is informed by work that we've done with thousands of rural farmers over the years. This center will provide three key services. It will provide farmers access to training inputs, and it will also create a space for storage and, and processing that will help to reduce the devastating post-harvest losses. Also, it will create a space for entrepreneurship and training for farmers and young people to ensure that we have agricultural enterprise, enterprises. 
Now, 43% of, of the Haitian population is currently insecure. That is one of the highest in the world. If we are look, as we look at this, Haiti is a very remarkable, remark, it's a country of remarkable beauty. It's also a country full of resources and potential. Now, as we look at the post-harvest losses in, ha in, the, in the country, post-harvest losses in Haiti is about 50% for vegetables and fruits, and 33% for, for cereals. That's actually a whopping $452 million in losses in income for smallholder farmers. And this is why we're proposing this center, because this center will do away with all the losses and reverse this trend. This one-stop shop will be built on 40 acres of land owned by HDI, worth about $2.2 million. It will help to accompany farmers like Marie, like my late grandfather, who could have used this service. Now, imagine where we are we're in a place where farmers in Haiti can access services financing, they can access entrepreneurship cent an entrepreneurship center that will create enterprises and also will get young people in Haiti a renewed interest in agriculture. This, this center is going to revitalize agriculture, but also it will create an, an economic boost for the 200,000 people who live on the Acadian coast. It will also give farmers a space to reverse the loss that we have from post-harvest storage, from post-harvest uh, losses. What we're seeking for this initiative is $5 million, with $3 million of that in grants and $2 million in investment of diverse, of diverse uh, types. This initiative is catalytic for communities and for people like Marie to help to take care of their families. And it is also catalytic to give young people in Haiti a stake in their communities and in their future. Please join us in creating viable communities in Haiti. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Manuel Modelo, and I want to invite you to take a deep breath with me and to visualize yourself within this landscape. From 2013, 10 years now, we have been working with and for uh, small farmers from coffee growers from Chiapas, southern Mexico, to set up an innovative economic development model that aims to break the vicious circle of poverty and to unlock the potential for sustainable impact. In close and in depth uh, conversation with them, uh, we are addressing the three main challenges to reach prosperity in rural communities. First, small farmers require credits to invest in their plots and improve productivity and therefore income. Also, their cooperatives require credits to sell that coffee into direct markets and get better prices. And they all need also um, access to knowledge through training and technical assistance 
not only to make things happen, but also to empower them as a primary subject of what we do. The synapses model do, does, does that while putting the impact on rural communities at the center of what we do, and by coordinating and synchronizing those three main services in a way that works for them. In other words, we are setting up an open environment which from any smallholder, any smallholder or cooperative can take advantage of. We have two uh, social enterprises uh, for financial inclusion, one for smallholders and a new one for cooperatives. We have a channel, a trading company to export the coffee, and we also have an NGO with five integrated programs that empower farmers, leaders, youth, and women. We have demonstrated results for more than 3,000 families and eight cooperatives so far. The synapsis model works, and we, will, we want to, 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 to grow and scale it and scale also our impact. We are asking for $5 million through four years to get the necessary scale for systemic change. But that is not the most important thing uh, that we are looking for. We need um, passionate partners that are, committed, that are committed with rural development and are willing to work with uh, the most vulnerable and impoverished people. We also need new and fresh talent and creativity to walk with us through this new path of growth and scale. And more than capital, we are looking for sustainable wealth for all of us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hola. How are you? To, how are you today? Good. Hi. I have my audience. So, hi. The first thing is that I really appreciate all of you being here and the intentions that brought you here above all. And well, I would like to make a little bit of the change in the way we approach social development. I want to make it through a smile, throughout good news, throughout happiness, and through um, sustainable ways in a very economical point of view. So let's see. OK, next. Ready? Because I am. So hi, everybody. I'm here to present you a remarkable opportunity that not only addresses a unique challenge faced by the thousand, sorry by over 11,000 of beekeepers in the Yucatan Peninsula, but also taps into the ever-growing honey market. In Yucatan, these beekeepers represent more than a quarter of, uh, of all Mexican producers, and it's time we empower them to thrive. Let me introduce you to MUCAP, a project that is destined to revolutionize the honey industry. For decades, honey companies in Yucatan have acted as intermediaries standing between the hardworking beekeepers and the end customers. MUCAP, hence, represents nowadays a monumental shift and a way to professionalize beekeepers in the region and with it to elevate their quality of life. Given the fact that the honey market shows no signs of slowing down, MUCAP operating as a social business and using a short circuit commercialization model is now creating an ever-growing win-win scenario for everyone involved. Ergo, by having invested in training, skills development, and ensuring beekeepers are equipped for success, 
MUCAP is now supporting its local economy with real employment opportunities within their communities. Our product is second to none. We take pride in overseeing every stage of production from the hive to the customer hands. Our customers trust our product because it's traceable, offering confidence and security. The honey is differentiated by its origin, stemming from endemic flowers in both monofloral and multifloral presentations. And the product has already found its way to the shelves of major retailers, such as Walmart, between, among other relevant Mexican franchises. In 2022 alone, we sold 49,000 pieces, generating over $29,000 in sales. And this is for family, families which income used to be, I'm gonna say some data, sad data, I'm sorry, but this is very important because their income used to be a little bit less than $6 per week, per family. So, this is just the beginning. We know we have the capacity to increase our production by 357%, unlocking an immense potential in this market. From our stash of socially relevant data, the social investment over the past 12 years from the Legorreta Hernandez Foundation the WKK Foundation and the Ray Dalio Foundation has transformed MUCAV's beekeepers into self-managers, self-learners, and agents of change, having overcome what we've named the social breaking point, break point, and a real, real, real social return on investment have been reached with their sales, profits, and above all, noticeable increase of quality of life. This journey is very from, far from over because we are committed to seeing the MUCA project throughout for the next five years. We firmly believe that the incredible, incredible people beh behind MUCA have the power to change not only their lives, but also the destiny of their communities. Together, we're taking the beekeeping, beekeeping industry to new heights. Join us in this incredible journey towards empowering beekeepers, driving its economical growth, and delivering a high-quality product to the world. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Patrick Dessous. I'm the executive director of uh, Kazeli and a uh, uh, funding member of the Haiti Food System Alliance. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Haiti. I would like to present you to Moise. Moise is young, energetic, farmer, and a client of the Haiti Food System Alliance. Haiti is in trouble. Farming communities are in trouble. So I want you to meet it's there in Sarah, one of the millions um, farming families in Haiti. It's there in Sarah, they harvesting a little small plot because we do have a, small of, um, a, a lot of small scale farmers in Haiti. So the sector is, um, is created by NGOs. For many years, we have a lot of investment that was made uh, in the agriculture sector and until now, we're still having a lot of difficulties to see the result. Um, and what we have now, if you look uh, uh, at CNN and other uh, news outlets, you see a lot of farming communities, the, the people, they're moving to the US, moving to other countries for better uh, livelihood. I want you to look at the screen. That's Haiti in 1980 and Haiti uh, today. So in 1980, we used to produce <laughs> in all of the regions, and now what we have, we have more Haitians. In 1980, we had about six million, and now we have about 12 million. So we're not producing enough for, uh, to feed the nation. Uh, now you see, as you see on the table, 60% of, of Haitians, they're living in, in poverty and 40% of them 
uh, chronically uh, food insecure. Local production only meets 40% of the national need compared to 80% of in, in 1980. So we want to do something, something uh, really revolutionary. That's what we create, the Haiti Food System Alliance. The Haiti Food System Alliance is what we call an uh, agricultural value chain optimization uh, approach to the, to, the pro to the problems we're facing right now. We are, it's, uh, it's led by locally led organizations, proven organizations that well know by the international community, farmer centric, and we're promoting radical collaboration. What we do, we deliver resources, services, tools to farmers like Moise you saw at the beginning, smiling. And so far we, we have achieved, uh, we have supported 30,000 farmers and help, 40, uh, and help feed 40,000 Haiti's most vulnerable. So what we're looking for exactly? We're looking at uh, like a, co a philanthropic uh, combination of 2.5 million. 1.5, we're gonna use it to, to improve our program, have a strategic plan, pay for the, for the staff and the secretariat, and we will need 1 million to use it as a revolving fund so we can use it as trade credit to make sure the farmers, like Moise you see at the beginning, and uh, Itzia and Sarah, like you saw Itzia and Sarah uh, on the second slide, to actually make ends meet, pay for the school tuition for the, for the kids, and actually make a better life for, for them. Thank you. This apparently is just a jar of a gourmet product. It looks like a tropical habanero marmalade, but for us, it's our tool to bring social innovation to low-income communities in southern east of Mexico. My name is Carlos Ponce de Leon, and I'm the founder of Ethic Foods, and I want to share with you our recipe to social innovation gourmet. Our first ingredient is working with the producers of the raw materials. We use a method of agroecological to have the best quality of products and, and ingredients possible. Then I want to introduce with you with the stars of our story. They are Atala, Maria, Juana, and Marbella, and they are the women who produce and transform all our, all, all our products. There are Mayan-speaking women who live in low-income communities, and they work together to make like the products of marmalades, of, of tropical marmalades and tomato, or products like sauce, hot sauces like, like watermelon and pineapple. When they start to work with our model, they increase their income in 30%. And nowadays we are working with 27 uh, families who most of them are, are women. Now we have reached uh, like the Coffee Priest certificate that is the national uh, certificate. We have FDA and we start to sell the products here in New York, and we will be in the East Coast very soon. Also, we have these uh, partnerships like A2 Artisans Mexico, who is the nonprofit when, which we work together to bring all these uh, opportunities to the communities. Now we are seeking for $220,000, the half in investment and the half to grant. And that is, will be used to 
improve our marketing strategy and to find more small producers to increase our impact and still spread our uh, and to spread our recipe with more uh, people. Dios Botic, thank you. Hello, I'm Jerico De Casey. I'm the managing director of Alina Energy. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Alina Energy. So Alina Energy is a solar renewable energy company. And the first thing I wanna start with is our origin story. So our origin story starts with a seven-year-old kid who sat in a dark room. This seven-year-old kid was sad to say the least. The reason so is because it was the summer. It was the summer and he thought that he was going to go to sleep late and he was gonna have fun with his family and friends and, but unfortunately it got dark and all the lights went off. Well, there were no lights, but it was off. And um, so, but what happened on that day was something that was like a miracle. We had this incandescent light bulb that was in the middle of the room. This light flickered and then it turned on. And from there, the whole neighborhood erupted. People were ecst ecstatic, they were yelling, saying, they gave power, they gave power. And that was the reality back then. We were all excited. And so from that day on, I made the commitment to myself that I would make sure that no kid ever gets that excited for electricity. So one thing that one thing that we from that from then on one thing that we decided to do was to ensure that electricity or the availability of electricity becomes a normality. And it's not we don't get excited for receiving it for one hour, but we get disappointed when we don't get it. And so as I, okay, clicker doesn't seem to be work, got it. Okay, so the problem is, so when we, so fast forward now, let's say 20 years later, we looked into the problem, we dug deep, and we tried to figure out why is there an electricity problem in Haiti? And one thing that we saw was the problem is magnified in rural areas. So while the country, the electrification rate in the country is 72%, only the electrification rate in rural areas is only 15%. And this is because of a combination of things. So one thing is the upfront cost of electrifying those areas. And the second reason is opportunity cost, the ability to accurately size, and the fact that households aren't so close together. So we came up with a solution. This, so this solution allowed us to address these problems. I won't go into the technicalities of this solution, but one thing that I'll say is we've partnered with experienced suppliers and we found a way to deploy at a rate that's 70% faster than the solutions that's on the market today. And then in addition to that, we save our consumers 60% with um, this current solution. So what we've done to date is we've raised enough funding to provide 50,000 50, people with energy. In addition to that, we've created over 200 jobs, and by 2025, we believe that number is going to be over 325 jobs. We've assisted entrepreneurs, which means we've helped them increase their standard of living, and in addition to doing this in a clean way, where we're providing them with clean energy. So, what we're asking for today is approximately $4 million. What this $4 million would do is it would help 100,000 people not get excited when they receive electricity for one hour. It would help children be disappointed when they go on to turn on the lights 
and it doesn't turn on. So this 4 million would energize 23,400 households in addition to the 10,000 that we've already energized. Thank you very much.